And I'm going to start over there. So welcome everyone uh, to our Lake Stewardship and Restoration webinar on May 9th. And joining us this evening is, uh, my name is Kelsey Norton. I'm a watershed planning coordinator with the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance. And my presentation today will be kind of covering lake stewardship in the watershed, as well as we have Carrie from Cows and Fish, the Riparian uh, Society, as well we have Bradley from Alberta Lake Management Society. So we kind of picture the presentations to be about 25 minutes long with uh, <clears throat> some spare time after to answer any questions that you guys might have. So we don't plan on taking up kind of the full two hours with presentations. So if we manage, <clears throat> sorry, to kind of stay within our times at the end, we'll leave the floor open to kind of have an open discussion to answer any additional questions that maybe we weren't able to get to. Um, so yeah, I'm very fortunate enough to be able to speak to Lake Stewardship. Uh, it's kind of a passion of mine. Uh, a lot of experience has brought me to where I am. Um, kind of have more experience with a lot of the parkland and uh, mixed kind of boreal, uh, boreal uh, region. So that's kind of where my efforts currently are. So um, I actually live around Lac St. Anne Lake, so fortunate enough again to have a small acreage around there, and if you're up for it, feel free to put in your chat um, a, <clears throat> a lake that you're involved with or a lake that you recreate at or are fortunate to live at. So I wanted to uh, start this evening off in a good way. So water is life and land is our home. These elements are interwoven and foundational. In the spirit of respect and reciprocity, I acknowledge that the lands within the watershed of the North Saskatchewan River are in Treaty 6, Treaty 8, and the Métis homeland. These lands are the traditional territories, traveling routes, and gathering places of the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, Stony, and Nakota Sioux. We recognize and thank the Indigenous peoples who have cared for this cared for this land since time immemorial and whose rich histories, cultures, languages, and presence continue to enrich these sacred lands that we all steward as treaty people. So together, great things can happen and will be accomplished for, to, for future and today's generations. So before we begin, as you may notice, we are recording. Um, I ask that you please turn off your video and keep your microphone muted during the presentations just to allow for kind of focused uh, for the presenter, uh, presenters as well as more bandwidth. And if you have any questions, kind of use uh, the chat feature, please, and we'll take them at the end of the presentations. And feedback is strongly encouraged, so feel free to uh, send any additional kind of comments to our water at NSWA email. So I say this word a lot, uh, so I'll cover what it means. So wherever you are, you're in a watershed. So water from rain, snow melt, and groundwater flows its way and kind of outflows into a water body. Water can have quite a journey through a watershed, whether it's meandering down hills, through forests, or slowly being released through wetlands. And of course, it goes across kind of anthropogenic, so human-made features, such as developed areas across croplands and pavement. So the water meets at streams and creeks where it finds itself eventually in water, larger water bodies such as rivers or lakes. So the area of land or gathering ground from which water drains is the watershed. So a little background on the North Saskatchewan River watershed. It's uh, around 57,000 uh, square kilometers. So quite a large area to kind of manage uh, with uh, over 1.5 million people that call it home. The headwaters originate kind of over, over on the west side here at the Saskatchewan Glacier in Banff National Park, where it meanders all the way down through kind of the Edmonton metropolitan area and keeps going, where it eventually actually meets the South Saskatchewan River near Prince Albert. So as you can manage how we manage, or so as you can see how we manage the water kind of throughout from the headwaters and throughout, it will definitely have downstream effects for our friends over in Saskatchewan. So uh, in this picture, it kind of depicts the municipal boundaries, which obviously don't interlock with the sub watersheds. There's 12 that can be broken down. So you see the necessity and the interconnectedness, uh, the need for joint efforts as well as communication. So I pulled out here the Sturgeon River sub watershed, which is actually where I'm located. It's kind of where my knowledge lies for sure. So it's actually five times the size of Edmonton. The major tributaries are Toad, Kalini, Carrot, and Little Egg Creek. So this is just a small kind of area that's 
uh, fed mainly just by rain and snowmelt and runoff, and it has a handful of kind of small lakes that have uh, kind of that interconnectedness system that you can see. And an interesting note uh, with the lakes in this area is that there's like a, a big storage capacity that they have. So the residency time for a lot of the water in Lake Isle here is eight years, and then Laxanan is 10 years. So what we kind of put into the water will actually end up staying in there for that long. A lot of the land cover as well that makes up this area is 4% being urban centers and the majority being actually agricultural areas, such as crops and pastures, and the remaining 5% is made up of roads and as well as oil and gas and landfills. And I just quickly wanted to go over who we are as the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance. So under the Provincial Water for Life strategy, the, <clears throat> the North Saskatchewan River Watershed Alliance was uh, designated as one of 11 watershed planning and advisory councils in 2005. And as you can see at the bottom here, these are the list of kind of the main goals that came out of the strategy. So safe, secure drinking water, healthy aquatic ecosystems, and reliable water supplies for a state sustainable economy. And there's lots of different partners at play here. So a key one being the Alberta Water Council, which is provincial wide kind of reports on the progress of the water for life strategy. And so we have the watershed planning and advisory councils and obviously watershed stewardship groups as well. So uh, we're yeah one of 11. So as you can see, there's one for each major ri uh, river basin throughout Alberta. So if you ever kind of meander through any of these other areas, make sure to check out the other WPACs. So for us, uh, in the late 1990s, EPCOR, TransAlta, Toronto Limited, as well as Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and the City of Edmonton were working on separate initiatives, uh, which kind of morphed uh, uh, into a progressive kind of uh, initiative where the collaboration came together for the health of the river. So in 1997, they amalgamated the NSWA and in 2000 became a registered society. So the main four program areas that we focus on are education outreach, environmental stewardship, uh, watershed evaluation and reporting, and watershed management planning. So um, we definitely face a significant challenge in the work because of the geographic context and the diversity of the drainage basins and the complexity of human impacts definitely uh, changes throughout the watershed. So uh, different scales, there's different kind of water bodies throughout. So you can see the reasoning why um, we all brought here today is to care about lakes and be a lake steward. So with that, I'll dive into lake stewardship in the watershed. So uh, I always like to say that lake stewardship is a journey, uh, definitely short and long-term goals, whether you're a private landowner, a recreationalist, or whichever sector or stakeholders or type that you represent. And with that, I actually wanted to launch a poll just to actually see, kind of gain a better uh, perspective as to actually who is here today. So if you can see that popped up on the main screen, um, which sector are you affiliated with? Uh, be it a interested landowner, a producer, or kind of the various different ones throughout. So uh, I keep kind of going, so feel free to kind of launch uh, your answer in there. So learning new things is uh, kind of a skill we'll learn throughout our whole life. Uh, and it's an important journey full of lots of information and room to grow, whether you're just starting today or been at this for your whole life. So throughout uh, Alberta, there's actually over 600 freshwater lakes and um, and in Canada, we have, uh, sorry, in Alberta, we have 2.2 of Canada's freshwater and lakes are definitely not plentiful in our watershed. Only 2% of our watershed is actually made up of lakes. So highlighting the need to really steward the ones that we are fortunate to have. So thanks to everyone. So we definitely have uh, an interesting mix. So we have Lots of interested landowners, which is great to see. We have some watershed stewardship groups, government, some other WPACs here, which is awesome, and educational institutes. So awesome. Thank you guys so much for bringing that in. But so why are lakes important? <laughs> so proper lake function is such an essential part uh, for mitigating the impact of floods and droughts uh, that slow release during shortages. Lakes also replenish groundwater, they positively influence water quality of downstream watercourses, and they're foundational for migration, 
uh, stops as well as breeding grounds for many birds and they actually acts as refugees and corridors for a wide variety of wildlife. And they're also essential for people being able to connect culturally or for food harvesting. So I was able to kind of get this map that showcases a lot of the water bodies throughout the watershed. So as you can see, uh, throughout kind of the upper foothills and lower foothills, there's nothing too major. But as you kind of meander through the river, this is kind of that Sturgeon River subwatershed here, and then kind of the heart of Edmonton. And then, yeah, so there's lots of lakes up in this area, <clears throat> as well as down into this area. This is the Beaver Hill area. So lots of plenty kind of scattered throughout. So again, only 2% of our watershed is made up of lakes. And I wanted to share with you, hopefully this will work. It was supposed to be a video, but we'll see. <laughs> Oh, there we go. So yeah, most of the lakes were formed uh, in Alberta or kind of in this main area approximately 10 to 12,000 years ago. So when the glaciers retreated, they left depressions where water pooled and showcasing here how obviously over time the landscape has been modified. So this was from 1980s all the way up till 2020. And you can start to see some natural areas grow as well as obviously some other areas shrink. And there's obviously many different land uses uh, from mining, coal and aggregate to crop and cattle producers, small acreages, subdivisions and so on. So an important factor for lakes is definitely kind of taking that step back and looking at the bigger picture. As we start to kind of alter the natural functioning of a lot of these watersheds, uh, it'll impact the lake's water quality and quantity and how it moves. And there are different linkages uh, between the water and land. So it's very important that we see that connection as we depend on the landscape for lots of natural resources and how we manage them will definitely kind of affect us in a way, whether it be through kind of uh, flooding and drought or kind of land use practices. So if you can see like what's happening upstream, conversely, how are we affecting downstream communities? So management has to occur at that watershed scale, like collectively and collaboratively. Uh, that action will lead to better management to keep the health of these lakes for future generations. And I wanted to go over a couple issues that a lot of lakes face. Uh, there's some similar, kind of depends on where you are throughout the watershed. Uh, so a lot of ones that I've seen throughout my time uh, being a lake steward, as well as involved with NSWA is invasive species. So up in the top um, right corner here. So this is flowering rush, which is an invasive aquatic plant that is found at Lake Isle. And this is Himalayan balsam, another issue with invasive uh, species there. And obviously water quality. <laughs> so I know no one probably wants to go take a dip in any of these, but these are kind of the reality that a lot of the lakes face. So they kind of become overproductive <clears throat> and that natural system gets inputs from kind of runoff, which can cause like the increased severity as well as early onset of a lot of blue-green algae blooms. So uh, depending on kind of the recreation or how the lake is accessed, um, it can kind of open the doors for a lot of uh, these kind of issues. And yeah, that's how we start to see uh, the degradation of lake health. So how we manage these areas is extremely important and how the watershed is managed even municipally, be it for uh, policy and planning, will also have effects as well. So I kind of wanted to get a, a little bit of a grasp on lake science. So few lakes in Alberta actually have that natural kind of high quality sandy shores that were, you know, I think everyone kind of uh, is sought after. <laughs> so as you can see, the lakes uh, kind of in this area and the dry mixed wood and boreal area are quite shallow. <laughs> so, however, uh, some uh, most of them have a maximum depth of at least over eight meters. But I wanted to showcase the phosphorus kind of cycle and how it plays in soils, as that's a key nutrient for growth and develop sorry growth and development of plants and animals. And in aquatic in aquatic systems, phosphorus is typically the limiting nutrient, and when added in excess, that enriches that productivity. So which means increased aquatic vegetation, algae blooms, and decreased water uh, clarity. So here I've highlighted, yeah, the, the kind of the phosphorus cycle and the role it plays in soils as it's kind of that kind of key nutrient there. So the alteration of landscapes that kind of prompts uh, all this drainage and runoff results in faster and greater amount of phosphorus loading into surface waters. 
So there can be point source or non-point source contamination, which uh, the point source contamination can be easily identified and easily monitored, such as municipal or industrial discharge pipes or wastewater. However, <clears throat> uh, the type of other contamination being non-point source, which is usually kind of the harder one to kind of trace down to its origin and it's difficult to monitor, uh, can be runoff from agricultural or developed land and it's difficult to kind of keep a tab on. So one key takeaway is that, yeah, so having shallow lakes and then the mixing of all the sediments and the phosphorus kind of, you know, uh, increases the likelihood of, you know, the water quality degrading. However, a lot of science has shown, um, at least one with Laxanan, that a lot of the sediment is very rich in phosphorus already, so uh, there's blue-green algae uh, blooms right before uh, before European settlement and so on. So it's not that they never happened, but the risk and the kind of worry is that they'll be more severe as well as they'll be <clears throat> occurring earlier on in the year as well. And I know, yeah, another hot topic being lake levels. <laughs> so. Uh, a lot of the lakes, yeah, don't receive, you know, that mountain kind of fresh glacial runoff. So they have a little bit of a more unique uh, hydrological cycle and kind of the central part. Um, so responding more to like local weather and like overall climate. So water levels are very dependent on snowmelt and precipitation to cover the loss of uh, through evaporation. So water license holders, industry and other people that pull from the water need to be kind of managed properly so that the lake ecosystem can still be functioning. So the variability in water resources is a natural kind of phenomenon that can't usually be linked to just one, you know, cause or rather, it's kind of usually cumulative impacts that kind of start to see the steady decline in water, water levels. But the amount of water available affects its quality in the end. So high flow can wash sediments, chemicals, and nutrients, causing a flush into the system. While conversely, when there's less water coming into the water bodies, the capacity to dilute and assimilate the excess materials decreases. So I love uh, to be able to showcase this because a lot of lakes go up and a lot of lakes go down. And a big part of being a lake steward and kind of if you're involved with the group or be it what it may, you want to know your audience. So this depicts a lot of the, the different land uses around Lac St. Anne Lake. So quite similar to a lot of other lakes. So you can see there's different municipalities. There's Alberta Beach. There's Sunset Point all the way to Yellowstone. And we have the Lexus Nakota Sioux First Nation and some other summer villages. But definitely a lot of it is private land. So there are opportunities for conserving areas uh, for municipalities. They can create environmental reserves that serve to provide uh, public access to the water as well as support lake health. And it kind of highlights the need for that intermunicipal collaboration and development plans that ensure that neighboring municipalities work together regarding kind of that uh, cost sharing and delivery of different projects. And when it comes to where to help people manage their land, um, there are policies and planning and different uh, development uh, bylaws in place that restrict certain aspects that may affect the environment. So some have variable setbacks and <clears throat> it's ideal to kind of hire someone to kind of uh, outline a lot of the guidelines that should be followed and a lot of municipalities, sorry, <laughs> municipalities have their own. However, a lot of these small uh, kind of villages and small uh, summer villages really have kind of that environmental expertise. Hard time connecting with private landowners is another issue on kind of best management practices for shorelines. They're also going through the process of, of getting, uh, sorry, approvals, both provincially and federally. They find that to be an issue. And yeah, we kind of hope to uh, better, I guess, provide them with the resources and tools and kind of elevate that understanding that lakes are kind of the backbone of a lot of the kind of economy and like a lot of the tourism that comes into these areas. So kind of take a, I guess, eye shot of this and then next you can see the riparian intactness. So through our riparian health action plan, we were able to develop an evaluation tool <clears throat> that evaluated riparian conditions at a watershed scale. So intactness was defined as the extent to which the natural riparian habitat or shorelines have been altered by human activity. So highly intact shorelines are dominated by natural vegetation, while others that are classified as low intactness are dominated by human built structures or disturbed vegetation. So it's not measuring health by any means, but kind of that intactness and then that pressure. 
So you can kind of see there's opportunities for restoration <laughs> as well as conservation, which can be found on our riparian web portal. But uh, this is Laxina, which isn't doing uh, all that too bad. So it has a 63% overall high intactness, which is pretty good. And yeah, you can definitely check out more lakes as we have, doo -doo, there we go, results for lots of lakes. <laughs> so 426 with the shoreline length of over 3,000 kilometers with an average rate of about 50 set, 56 sorry, for high intactness. So if you're curious about your lake, I definitely recommend you go check out the repairing web portal. There's uh, data, uh, data available as well as summary tools. <clears throat> There's lots of also examples of on the ground projects that people have implemented and kind of can give you a good, a good, a good idea, sorry, of different uh, types of initiatives that you can also take on. And yeah, it's publicly accessible. So I feel free to go check that out. So Lake Stewardship uh, wanted to provide some guidance on how to get involved. So this is a great kind of snapshot from the Alberta government's uh, Respect Our Lakes program. So the role of key lake organizations in Alberta. So kind of where do you fit in? So this can be very dependent on your interests as well as kind of obviously how much time you have available. Um, also, what's, what's your passion is a big one. So people usually start kind of connecting and assembling when there is an emergent concern, usually around water quality or quantity seems to be the big one, but there is probably something already happening at your lake, most likely, be it for kind of monitoring or projects or uh, be it what it may, there's very unique stuff going on. Uh, so depending on what it is, this can kind of showcase what level you want to get involved, whether it's kind of with an environmental nonprofit or organization, the academic institutions, conducting research, or even with your municipality and kind of staying in touch on what they're kind of up to is a good uh, kind of key piece as well. So highlighting the amazing watershed spiritual groups in our watershed. So these are just a small little list that I kind of combined here. So uh, we're fortunate, uh, to say the least, to have an immense presence as well as uh, kind of in our watershed that are not only kind of spearheading projects, but they're kind of innovative kind of as well as that community involvement and engagement. And it's just uh, amazing to see. So some have that society status and they can apply to grants and complete projects as well as they have charity status, they're able to accept donations, as well as they're kind of private, uh, usually just community members that kind of gather together. So you don't need to, uh, by any means, have an environmental background to be a lake steward or to get involved with the group. Uh, most members have kind of opposite careers uh, from environmental work from what I've seen. Um, as well as a lot of the members are made up of elected officials. So that's a good way to kind of connect with your municipality. And it's always great to see kind of interested people because yeah, there's different players needed for a group to be successful. And uh, kind of the more interdisciplinary the group, I think the better kind of could, to get those diverse views as well as kind of thoughts on how to best approach different uh, issues. And as well as a lot of these lakes here, as you can see, have a state of the watershed completed. So this provides kind of a baseline information for watershed planners and other decision makers, uh, kind of summarizes a lot of the environmental information about the watershed. And it also identifies knowledge gaps, which is a huge one. And it also makes recommendations for focus and future direction. And not all of these groups by any means have like a watershed management plan to follow like objectives and actions, but a lot of the issues, like I said, are kind of interchangeable, be it for water quality, quantity, invasive species. So the more active and involved people get, the more successful a group can be. It's very easy to get burnt out uh, for a lot of these. So if you're fortunate enough to live around a lake or recreate, I recommend uh, definitely checking these out. And... And there's obviously lots of great environmental organizations, although not all lake specific. I think there's, once again, that kind of interconnectedness that a lot of the uh, opportunities kind of involve lakes to some extent. So yeah, depending on your interests, you can guarantee there's probably a stewardship organization out there for you. Um, lots of them have different resources or uh, workshops and webinars available. Um, a good one is the Land Stewardship Centre has a Green Acreages program, as well as a Watershed Stewardship Grant, a Stewardship Toolbox and Directory, as well as to kind of get the, the group going and on their feet. And of course, we have, <laughs> not listed here, but we also have the Alberta Lake Management Society and Cows and Fish. And 
please stay tuned. Uh, we hope to have a Lake Stewardship webpage full of lots of resources on communications, funding opportunities, and citizen science. And municipalities are definitely involved in lake stewardship. It's been amazing to see throughout uh, my time with NSWA. So these are just a handful of ones that I collated together just to showcase a lot of the great work that the municipalities do take on. So depending on the one that surrounds the lake, uh, there will be different kind of programs available and opportunities. Um, so some vary from their ALICE program, so alternative land use services, which kind of works with producers to kind of get the cattle away from water bodies. And there's also shoreline restoration projects completed by Parkland County and Strathcona County just took on the wetland replacement program, as well as a great one is with Clearwater, who has the Clearwater Land Care, which is an environmental stewardship program. So here I just wanted to depict how kind of maybe a little bit of a flow. I think everything kind of becomes full circle in the end, <laughs> but um yeah once again kind of people come together and rally when there is a pertinent issue so not everything can obviously be tackled at once i think everyone would get exhausted if that were the case so i think once there is the issue definitely check out uh kind of start researching gathering information there's lots of different unique things out there for projects and uh throat time so there's probably one that's been completed at your lake i can almost guarantee so um, there's lots of information on the Alberta.ca uh, lake information website from blue green algae to legislation. And if you're interested in water quality guidelines, you can check out uh, that link or that uh, second one there. And if you're interested in water quantity, you can check out, check out sorry, real time and historical data on the Government of Canada's website. So another key part of lake stewardship is meetings, <laughs> the fun part. Um, it's a huge resource tool, uh, to be completely honest, having coordinated meetings, having them scheduled, kind of reoccurring, or you can have them uh, monthly or quarterly, and to be inclusive. I think there's so many different stakeholders around lakes, it's important to get everyone's voice into there. And also another one is funding, getting uh, money to do the projects <laughs> can be a fun one. So depending on if you have a group, uh, you can get uh, donations, you can raise funds as well as apply to grants and to make sure, um, you know, how you've succeeded in lake stewardship or being a steward is to kind of set performance measures, have goals and objectives, um, you know, short term and long term. And ideally a timeline, I think uh, kind of puts, you know, some I guess the fine line between when to when to know and a big part too sorry is always share your successes i think that's one thing that we don't do a whole lot so even the small wins are very important so lake stewardship and nswa's role so as i mentioned uh our watershed can be broken down into 12 sub watersheds so we're fortunate enough to have sub watershed alliances for three that kind of combine different municipalities. So we have the Headwaters Alliance, as well as the Sturgeon River Watershed Alliance and the Vermilion River Watershed Alliance. And I'm fortunate to be the coordinator of the Sturgeon River Watershed Alliance, which is a municipally supported watershed stewardship group that brings together various stakeholders throughout the watershed. We're fortunate enough to have Kind of that collective gathering of people which is guided by a steering committee of elected officials and a technical advisor committee which brings together kind of the environmental coordinators people with stewardship groups or kind of different uh, players throughout the area and so earlier i did mention uh, watershed management plans so we are fortunate to have a handful of ones two for being for lake so wobman lake has one as well as mayatan lake so these are municipally supported uh, kind of approach, voluntary, it's not advocacy by any means, so kind of supports the coordination of local and regional stewardship. It has those clear goals and performance measures, and once again, that interdisciplinary collaboration and kind of encourages the actions to address those knowledge gaps. So what has the Sturgeon River Watershed Alliance been up to over the last little bit? There's been a couple things, uh, obviously, with the issues. So the kind of pertinent ones being water quality. <laughs> so be it kind of like with Lake Isle all the way to Lac St. Anne, uh, as well as low water levels in late summer and fall and extensive impacts from agriculture and agriculture, sorry, and rapid urbanization and the loss of a lot of the natural systems. 
So we've been able to tackle on a lot of the knowledge gaps, some kind of relating to lakes, some kind of filling in the gaps. Um, so we're fortunate to have the state of Laxanan and Lake Isle watersheds. So, and over the last few years, we've been working on some kind of key pieces. Uh, a big one being a water quality monitoring program from 2021 to 2022 that actually took samples along the Sturgeon River and actually showcases a lot of the kind of uh, parameters, so a lot of the water quality guidelines that were exceeded and kind of provides a lot of baseline information and what the state of the water quality is along that area. Another key one I wanted to bring up was our regional lake stewardship project, which kind of kicked off this year. So I mentioned we have hope to have a lake stewardship web page kind of up and running soon. So that's kind of a piece of this. And over the summer, we plan to have kind of a restoration demonstration site completed at a lake and kind of want, we hope to gather as many people from different lakes and kind of showcase the importance of natural shorelines and kind of incorporate a workshop into that. We'll be supporting Alms's lake monitoring and a big piece is more, instead of kind of that single support, we hope to kind of um, elevate that to the regional scale. And a big piece is connecting and collaborating. And lastly, I just wanted to um, recognize that we have lots of great communications with the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance. So we've had Watershed Wednesdays. So if you're interested in kind of anything and everything, I'm sure we probably covered it from eDNA to fish population updates. Uh, please go check out our in-stream newsletter. And uh, that's how you can kind of stay in touch with opportunities for workshops. So uh, last year we had a wetland day and in January we just had a road salt management workshop. And as well, we have lots of outreach opportunities for students that attend events throughout the summer, and we'll be supporting monitoring as well. And if you are interested, we have our annual general meeting at the Lodge at Snow Valley on June 28th. And with that, I just wanted to say thank you for listening. Uh, I hope kind of a key takeaway is just knowing that you're making a difference, uh, no matter how big or how small, a big piece is just kind of connecting with the community and knowing that, you know, issues aren't tackled overnight by any means, <laughs> lots of patience is required. Um, and the return on investment in nature and into lakes and watershed health is always worth it, be it kind of like culturally, spiritually, or overall well-being and for kind of that sustainable future that we all want for ourselves and for future generations. And with that, I will stop there. and take any questions. And if not, then all good. All right, and seeing none, with that, I would love to pass it over to our next presenter, Carrie. And yeah, it definitely looks like I went over time anyway, so <laughs> all good on we, that. We do have one question in the chat, sorry, but if you want, we can wait till the very end of all the presentations too to answer them. I'm okay if you want to ask answer the question for Kelsey now. Kelsey? Are you able to share your screen? Uh, there's just one question in the chat for you. Um, we're actually... I think it's maybe from me. I might have sent it to the wrong person. My name's Tara. I'm with the Mayotan Lake Management Association. I was just actually asking about what the event um, you were mentioning around your restoration project was. Something about a... I didn't quite catch what that was is that working for you Carrie uh yeah I'm just letting the 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 question being asked oh, be answered I can't hear you again for some reason oh. or maybe that's oh that's my end can other people hear me yes I think it's just okay. on Kelsey's end I think her audio is a bit there we go. <laughs> do you have the can you hear us now Kelsey 
Yeah, that was my thing. Okay, yeah, there was actually a question from Tara asking um, what the event surrounding your restoration project was. Was that for Carrie? I see Carrie at the bottom. I don't know. Oh, yeah, okay. No, I think that was for you. Okay. It was. Yeah. So, with the Regional Lake Stewardship Project, uh, we opened up applications to groups or municipalities to whoever that had an ideal site uh, that was open to the public, would be ideal to have a demonstration, kind of site that would be uh, have public. Uh, public area, sorry, that would have signage as well. And so we've had one sent in by Wizard Lake, as well as Wobbaman, uh, two for Lac St. Anne. So I hope to do some site visits and kind of implement a restoration project that kind of brings the community together, as well as a workshop component to kind of uh, uh, provide that educational piece as well. Great, thank you. There's also another question in the chat from Kyle asking if he directed towards me, and I'm not sure if he meant to direct it towards you, Kelsey, but he's asking if you have any suggestions about how Lake residents could begin to get together and establish a stewardship group. Well, that's a great question. So uh, dependent on, yeah, if there was kind of an issue at hand, um, a big one is knowing, yeah, the audience around. So who, what uh, the municipality is, uh, gathering a lot of the residents and yeah, kind of having that diverse background. If there's any Indigenous communities as well, I think they're very essential to have incorporated. So I think uh, whether you want it to be in-person meetings, I think are can be more valuable, uh, kind of kind of first start off a lot of watershed stewardship groups. And then uh, also with your meetings, making sure that there's like an agenda, as well as someone's, you know, taking those notes, as well as if you have, you know, it starts to go down the road of you want to be kind of a society, then having an accountant and different kind of players like that. Um, yeah, so I think the big thing is just gathering people and yeah, making sure people stay on track and yeah, don't get too excited about, you know, all the issues. I think having one kind of focus is ideal and yeah, kind of going from there. Okay, that looks like all the questions for you, Kelsey, for now, but if anybody has any more as uh, time goes on, definitely put them in the chat and we can follow them up um, later on. So I'm going to share my screen. Are we seeing full screen? Good to go. Excellent. All right. Well, welcome everyone. I recognize some of the names in the in the participant list. So welcome and hello again. And um, to those that are new, um, I'll welcome to you as well. And we're hoping that you'll you'll get some good information out of the uh, webinar this evening. So as mentioned, uh, my name is Carrie O'Shaughnessy and I am a riparian specialist and I work for this organization known as Cows and Fish and we're also called the Alberta Riparian Habitat Management Society. We're a not-for-profit organization and our primary goal, I guess, in life is better understanding riparian areas and helping others better understand their riparian areas. And we do that by fostering riparian stewardship. So some of these, uh, the stewardship messages that Kelsey talked about, we're one of those agencies or the, one of those organizations that can help support uh, stewardship groups that are looking, or individuals as well, that are looking to deal with a particular situation or an issue or just learn more. Now we are a not-for-profit organization. And so our members and supporters include Alberta Beef Producers and Trout Unlimited Canada, which are two of our founding members. So the cows and the fish part kind of came together there. And then we have other partners as well, including Government of Alberta, Canadian Cattlemen's Association, Association of Agricultural Fieldmen and Rural Municipalities of Alberta. And those are some of the organizational partners, but we also have a lot of individual partners like producers, municipalities, community groups, lake residents, um, acreage, acreage residents, anybody that has a riparian area that might be an issue or might be of interest is we consider one of our members and, um, and supporters. Now you might be asking yourself, well, why the heck is an organization called Cows and Fish talking about lakes? 
And really what it comes down to is that all water bodies have this thing called a riparian area. And the riparian area in sort of short terms is that green zone of water loving vegetation next to a water body. So the plants are a little bit different because they keep their feet wet. They've got their roots in water all the time. The soils are adapted to having sort of being inundated with water more uh, throughout the year. And so whether it's a stream or a river, floodplain, for example, you know, that's a riparian area. A lake shore, a wetland fringe, those are also riparian areas. So everything from our recreational lakes right down to some of the smallest potholes um, and then over to the flowing systems that are sort of feeding into those lakes and wetlands are all connected with this riparian landscape. So even the shorelines of, of lakes, so some of you might even live on a riparian area or right next to one. It's sort of that zone of influence right from sort of the cattails and open water and that those plants that are growing, you know, in the water and partly out all the way back through to say a ring of willows and then into the, our riparian forest. And most, uh, some lakes and wetlands have sort of that fringe and those bands of vegetation. Other times water just meets, meets whatever vegetation happens to be growing there. So even waterfront property can be riparian. And sometimes we develop these riparian areas and that's sometimes when we start to see, you know, some of the issues that are related to the lake. So some of the things that Kelsey talked about. So we love our riparian areas. We love our lakes, we love our streams and rivers. And sometimes we do end up changing them in such a way that it over time or eventually can contribute to a negative effect on the lake. So when we think about a riparian area, it's kind of like a buffer. So it's sort of like a, you know, a zone that if we can leave it intact, so Kelsey sort of referred to, you know, native vegetation, having a wide area that is sort of undisturbed or, or minimally disturbed, I'll say, that can help to mitigate any, you know, things that are coming off the watershed, because we also have the watershed area that Kelsey talked about contributing things to that lake as well. So if we've changed our riparian area from you know, a natural forest, for example, to a paved area or, you know, a, a mowed lawn that shifts the way that that buffer can, can help and actually do some work to help protect the lake. So healthy shorelines do a lot of things for us. Naturally, they help to maintain water quality. They can prevent soil erosion. They, um, in high water, there's lots of energy that comes through from waves, for example. Um, it can reduce that, that erosive impact. It can definitely provide wildlife uh, with food and habitat as well as livestock. And then there's a high biodiversity in riparian areas as well, particularly when they're healthy. So when we have this area that's influenced by a higher water table, that makes them a bit unique. And if we think about sort of how those things we just talked about, like water quality and biodiversity, you know, how those things sort of come to be, it's because that vegetation and that soil are doing some ecological processes. So things like trapping and storing sediment that might be carrying a pollutant as it's going, you know, from the upland through to the lake. It's helping to provide soils that are productive and keeping that, you know, I'll say the good stuff on land, like again, high nutrient soil, that once it gets into the water can cause problems like algae blooms. Recharging groundwater, you know, uh, slowing down energy, and also again, linking to that biodiversity piece. So that's what a ra uh, riparian area does. And in a lot of ways, it's the plants that are growing there that are going to be part of that solution. So if you have erosion, problems, if you've got your own runoff issues, if, um, you know, there's a lack of birds in your area, it might be because the plants that are growing there have, have shifted to something that maybe doesn't have as deep a binding root or doesn't grow as tall or doesn't have as much layers in it. So when we think about the sort of the types of vegetation that we would find around a lake in a riparian area that 
um, you know, has these abilities, it's things like cattails, it's things like bulrushes, things like tree, you know, even willows, and even keeping trees and shrubs in place are valuable for that, for all those purposes. And we've seen ex uh, good examples that where we've shifted to, you know, say a lawn grass, for example, right up to the uh, water's edge, that the, the lake shore or the riparian area, the bank just can't hold on as well. You know, that's when we start to see erosion and losing the land into the lake. Um, we see weeds develop um, and there's just not enough water, there's not as much water in the system overall. And we could throw big rock at some of these erosion issues in particular, or as an example. And in some ways that would work for a short period of time. But often what we find is that that rock just, it changes and shifts where the energy goes. Uh, water scours out or water gets behind it and then it falls apart. And eventually we end up having to replace that and it's quite costly. So looking to some more natural um, ideas uh, might, uh, might actually uh, prove better in the long run. And when we think about, you know, what is that impact, you know, Kelsey talked about phosphorus, and there's some really interesting work out of Wisconsin. It's a little bit dated, but it still shows, I think, some good, um, some good work. If phosphorus is the sort of leading uh, nutrient when it comes to algae blooms and water quality, just clearing a small area can contribute, you know, up to a ton of sediment which could be carrying two pounds of phosphorus to the lake. And if you clear an entire lot, you, 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 you multiply that and amplify the, uh, those impacts by you know, a, a bunch. And I think that's not news to anyone here. And the other thing is there's good, good data out there that literally shows that there's a shift in um, the types of animals and, and, spe and bird species that use certain types of lakes. So, you know, a lot of our more native um, common birds um, would, be, would be found in um, an undeveloped area uh, primarily. And then some of the more common ones um, tend to, there's more of them when we get to the development stage. And so if you're thinking about, you know, what is making that riparian area healthy and functioning, it's everything from having good vegetation there having very few invasive plants, having good diversity of native plants, having trees and shrubs, if that's the type of system that you're on, having soil and structure and topography that's close to natural, and limited bare ground and water levels that are allowed to fluctuate naturally. So if you've got a vision of what a healthy riparian or a functioning riparian area might look like, you might look at A and B and look at them and, and, and not quite know. But if we think about that list of things that I just talked about, you know, which one shows sort of those features uh, a little bit better? And in generally cases, it's A. And we can talk about health as being a measure of how well all those indicators are performing the functions. Now, these are just some examples of a, of a, of a, of a, of a riparian lakeshore that actually shifted over time. In the 1990s, it was, um, I would say, relatively unhealthy, not a lot of vegetation growing there. Uh, water levels shifted and changed at that time as well. And then the, to, the landowner or resident, lake resident made the decision that they're going to rest that beach and not, not sort of hair it anymore and, and just let it be. And over a period of you know, 10 or 12 years, it changed a lot. And now they, uh, back in 2012, they had a harder lake bottom, they had more frogs, they had more uh, birds, um, and they still had an, an access to the lake through their small dock. And they actually improved their riparian health overall. Um, so if we look at sort of, I'll just look, look at lakes and wetlands around the province. Um, Cows and Fish does a, a ground-based assessment of, of health and um, looking at uh, all those indicators. And if we look just at lakes and wetlands, we've got about a third that are in that healthy category. So doing all the, the functions and performing them as best as they can do. We've got um, another sort of quarter-ish that are in the unhealthy. So the other spectrum, end of the spectrum, not doing so well. And then there's a group that are in the middle that 
have some good things working for them and some not so much. So sort of a combination of those A and B pictures. And so when we think about um, the, uh, you know, how we maintain riparian health and healthy shorelines, there's some basic principles that we like to like to think about because there are a number of different strategies to achieve the same things. So things like, you know, not stressing it out. You know, do you have a good balance between the demand that the land can provide with uh, what, or the demand that you need with the available resource? Do you have uh, the ability to give it some rest after use? Being able to plan ahead to avoid certain times a year and not do certain activities, you know, when soils are wet or waters are high or birds are nesting. Do you have the ability to give it some space as well? So being able to distribute whatever activity it is you got going on to other parts away from the shoreline. Now, from the agriculture perspective, we do a lot of work with the agriculture community. And one of the ways that they achieve some of those principles is by providing off-stream water. So they may need a water source nearby, which could be a lake, could be a wetland stream or a well, and they would pump that water from the source up to um, a trough and so that will limit the number of animals that have to go down into the surface water in order to 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 drink another way um, and that that off stream water can be effective with or without a fence another way would be to combine that off stream water with fencing so be it as exclusion or done in such a way that the animals could go into that riparian area for a certain period of time at, a, at an appropriate time of the year, as opposed to, um, uh, and then be, be locked out um, at other times. And a whole bunch of other things that the ag community can do in terms of, and, and are doing in terms of figuring out ways that um, livestock can be moved away from those sensitive surface waters. And now cows and fish is a voluntary program. So if we're working with, with somebody, we it's usually because they've called us and we provide ideas and options and, uh, and suggestions and, um, and then help that producer, you know, potentially implement some sort of a project if they want to. Now we can do the same thing for lakefront um, property owners. Um, if you've got a riparian area, you've got a riparian fringe and um, you want to, help do your part towards improving the lake, then leaving some of that natural vegetation is one of the sort of the, I'll say the best things you can do. You know, that sort of that ounce of prevention kind of idea. If you've got it, keep it. And then just like in agriculture, you know, there's a bunch of different strategies that, that people can use. If you're living on a lakefront or a waterfront or even just, you know, back lot, there's a number of um, ideas that you can do as well. So just a quick poll here. I'd love to know um, what you have tried or done on your waterfront or on your lake lot. So there should be a poll that can be popped up. Maybe. Um, Kelsey, which poll? Right. Yeah. Just working on it right now. Oops. Sorry, the poll questions are a bit out of order. I know. Okay, great. So <laughs> what strategies would you like to implement or what have you done yet on your property? That I think is the, well, we can use that one, I'm sure. I just don't know if anybody can type into a long answer, can they? Somebody give it a try. I'm not having good luck or you missed one poll. It's lovely. <laughs> Gotta love this. We'll see what that did. Oh, yeah, that did not work the way I thought. <laughs> okay. Well, not we'll a problem. Yeah, Carry on. <laughs> We'll catch it. Well, maybe with we'll 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 try the other poll later. All right. Well, that. All right. I'm gonna carry on. 
Um, so I just wanted to touch quickly on, you know, if you're going to do some sort of a project or implement something um, on your on your lake lot, um, it's important to know sort of where your boundaries are. So I encourage everyone to, you know, check your property title and find out where that sort of high water mark is, which typically um, depicts the public uh, public land bed and shore. And also know if there's an environmental reserve that is in front of your property or not. And sometimes the riparian area covers parts or all um, of those uh, of those sort of jurisdictional ownership. But ecologically, it can go all the way right from you know where the emergent vegetation is out to open water, right back through the upland. Hey Perry, I found the poll. If you wanted me to quickly launch it here, um, sure. Go ahead. So this one is uh, what you can actually uh, pick some, uh, what management strategies you've tried or done on your land. Or that you've seen done. It might not even be that you've got, you, you have land yourself, but you've helped with or, or done. And if you're a back lot owner, you know, things like using less hardened surface. Oh, look at that. Good. The whole gamut. That's great. Excellent. No, that's great. All right, we can carry on. So most people are letting plants grow or not using chemicals. And some are using low impact uses. Some are respecting that environmental reserve. That's awesome. OK, great. So yeah, just keeping in mind that uh, there may be some, um, you know, some bylaws or, or regulations that you need to consider um, if you're going to be doing, um, you know, some things, particularly anything below sort of that high water mark. So what are some of the things you can do sort of without an approval? Um, generally, there is um, things like anything that's above sort of that break of a uh, bank that goes to water, you should you could could do um, most things um, up there without a permit. You can do removal um, of invasive plants, particularly above that high water mark, and you can put in a seasonal pier and take it out. And there's a variety of um, sort of regulatory bodies that might come into play if you want to do certain things. Um, everything from Federal Fisheries Act right down to um, our Municipal Government Act. And if you're not sure, always ask. So what are some of the things you can do? Um, things like keeping it native. So native plants are best adapted to your typically to your lake and yard. So if you have, you know, even a flower bed, using native plants is uh, typically going to be lower maintenance um, and right on the right on the lake shore is going to be a able to reduce erosion and absorb runoff. And we sort of have seen this a little bit already, just talking about how the different rooting systems of certain plants can help sort of protect that soil and protect that shore from wave action and from erosion. And so, you know, your, your trees and shrubs are typically going to do that best. Um, some of the sedges and cattails, sort of grass and, and broadleaf plant types, will the native ones will, will do it okay if there's not too much energy. But as we shift to lawn grasses and invasives and weeds, then that ability completely shifts and they, they just can't because their roots are different. They're shallow, they don't bind. So there's some um, resources out there that can help you plan. If you're gonna do a riparian planting project, for example, you're gonna add some diversity to, uh, to, a, to a shoreline area. Um, particularly, again, I would be aiming for above the high water mark. Um, and there's obviously different zones, right? There's the emergent out there in the 
in the open, uh, near the open water, that's going to be more water loving. And then the gradient of, of moisture tolerance is going to shift as you move further back. So there's some resources out there to help with that. And uh, just to zoom in, just to see some of those, um, some of those native plant names, some of them might pop out to you. And so here's a question. Where's this plant? This poll, um, I'm not sure what number it is, uh, Kayla, but what is this plant and how does it grow? Let's see. We got the choices are common bulrush, common cattail, flowering rush, giant burr reed, or water sedge. And then if you scroll down, there's a second part about where it grows. So drum roll, the answer is giant burr reed. So it's one of those things that kind of looks a bit like a cattail when it doesn't have any heads on it. Uh, the leaves are kind of kind of wide and broad, but they're um, they've got a, a you know a, a different different kind of shape to them, and they're a little bit lighter green. And then when it's get these seed heads, it's uh, it's pretty distinctive. So giant burr reed is that one. And where does it grow? It's emergent. So it's rooted underwater and then the leaves and flowers express themselves above water. Well done. And so some of the others uh, would be your, your, your native bulrushes, your common cattail and your sedges. So if you've got these, that's a good thing. You wanna keep them. Some of the other native plants that you might see and that you would, if you were gonna plant something, you might consider goldenrod, Solomon seal, or tall manna grass. If you're thinking about woody plants, willow, dogwood, Saskatoon, chokecherry, uh, poplar, all good things to have nearby. And thinking about, if you can, select a native species, one that's local to your area, because they'll typically do better. They might take a little, a little bit more care and attention to get going. Uh, but once they get going, they should last um, a very long time. And the ones to recognize that you don't want to have would be things like, you know, common tansy or toad flax or the day, some of the daisies. And um, Kelsey already mentioned these, but the uh, prohibited ones, things like flowering rush and Himalayan balsam. Uh, there's Himalayan balsam. And so these, uh, if you've got those types of plants, they are regulated by the province and need to be either controlled or eradicated. The best thing to do, again, is not to put them in there in the first place. If you're interested in beaches, think about actually creating a dry land beach. So one that's above the high water mark because it's against the rules to bring sand in and put it in the water uh, without a permit. And so uh, if you're able to, cook, to create a dry land beach, then you avoid that and you've got a place to, to hang out in the sand and you can let the lake do its thing. And just keep things sort of as, as native and natural as you can. All right, coming towards the end here. Now, if you've got the trees and the shrubs, and I know there's uh, obviously a lot of people want to be able to see the lake, that's partly why you're there. And there are some techniques that you can use to, to keep the rooting system and the canopy above and still get your view. So things like pruning, pruning, um, you know, either above or in the middle of the tree can allow that tree to continue to function and do its thing, as well as open up that view. And a number of different ways that uh, that you can do that um, as well. I'm not a pruning expert by any means, 
but if you can basically think about keeping the root, keeping the canopy, and finding ways to see through it. And embrace the messiness. I mean, we just, nature is messy. And when it's doing it, the things it's supposed to do, it's usually, you know, I think it's pretty, but some people might think it's messy. Thinking about that no mo zone or narrowing the path and minimizing your impacts, that's one way to do it. And thinking about that, that rooting system, what you sometimes you can't see, but that's doing a lot of the work for you. And it's based on the canopy above. So both are needed. And thinking about utilizing plants as their, you know, as a bioengineering technique. You know, bioengineering is using native materials to, you know, create retaining walls, um, but they're actually root walls. Um, you know, developing, planting native plants, shifting from rock and wood to maybe a, either a combination that's got some roots in it. Just some other examples of what bioengineering can do. And those are great volunteer opportunities as well. You know, getting people out to plant some some native native things is a is a great bonding activity. There's just some other examples of ways to naturalize these shorelines. This particular project, I was on Pigeon Lake, and um, I'm just going to really touch on it real quick. Basically, it was a uh, well maintained shoreline, lots of vegetation removal, constant um, in and out. And through a, a project there, um, a, an upland, an upland garden was put in, so to minimize the amount of lawn. And the shoreline was planted and staked with uh, with willow and just left alone. So other than removing some of the the invasive plants, the native plants were left to grow. And since about um, oh, the 2021 ore line. Um, has continued to uh, to have uh, you know a good response. You know the native the plants are there. The native plants are there. Uh, some of the willows didn't grow all that well, but that was a lesson learned. And um, the beaver came in and took the one naturally occurring willow that was growing there. They said thank you very much and took it with them. And the health score didn't improve very much uh, because there was still quite a lot of lawn in that short period of time. So in summary, um, there's all different kinds of strategies that people can use to achieve those principles. And um, ultimately, if uh, you build it, they will come. And um, if you're changing things, be prepared for what you might get. You know, you might end up with beaver on your land, or you might end up with bees, or you might end up with deer. Um, but those might be things that you're, that you're, that you're looking for. And thinking about, you know, not only what you're doing right on the lake, but in the watershed as well. And there's some materials and resources available through the Cows and Fish website that you can, uh, can download for additional information. So with that, this is me. If you want to get a hold of me um, through the, through after this, this is contact information for Cows and Fish and myself. And uh, feel free to reach out. Awesome. Well, if anyone has any questions, you guys can put them in the chat. Um, and I apologize if my camera's not working at the moment. Otherwise, I'd have it turned on for this. But well, yeah, and lovely presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carrie. Um, I think a good one, um, a great question I hear quite often is where can you actually acquire a lot of the different willow species? And I recommended, yeah, most kind of carry, uh, the local greenhouses carry them, but uh, do you have any specific ones that uh, you yourself use or cows and fish? No, it kind of depends on where you are. Um, a lot of the local, where whatever local area you're in, uh, your greenhouse or a, or a potential like a, a seed supplier should have them um, should have them available so um, it really depends on where you are and yeah you mentioned beavers so <laughs> they're a good uh, kind of way 
to kind of coexist and how do you kind of stop them from eating your lovely trees? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, probably the, if you've just got a few sort of trees that you're wanting to protect, um, things like uh, wire uh, can be one way to, you know, to, to, to set essentially some wire that's a fairly small mesh size is about a meter to a meter and a half high. Uh, that can, uh, that can do it. That can protect them, your trees. And if you've got a lot of, of area, it, you might consider just letting them have it for a while because they're not going to be there forever. Um, and so, but wiring is probably the most popular one. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your presentation, Carrie. I think yeah, my biggest thing was nature is messy. <laughs> I love that. So uh, with that, we'll pass it over to Bradley. Okay, thanks, Kelsey. Let me just try sharing my screen. Okay. Okay, so if you want to just give me a heads up, if it's working okay. Yep. Okay, thanks guys. Okay, so I'll just jump right into it. For those who don't know me, my name is Brad. I am the executive director at the Alberta Lake Management Society. And thanks Kelsey for the invite tonight. I recognize like Carrie, I recognize a number of names on the call tonight, but there's a number that I also don't recognize. So uh, I hope if you have questions or you want to learn more, you'll not be shy and you'll ask or you'll reach out afterward. So the Alberta Lake Management Society is a nonprofit based here in Edmonton. We're a fairly small organization with a goal of improving our understanding of lakes and reservoirs and their watersheds. And the way that we've really been pushing that in recent years is through citizen science or community-based monitoring programs. Um, some of our most popular programs are Lake Watch and Lake Keepers. Um, these programs are either participatory or traditional citizen science programs that we run all across Alberta. Lake Watch is one that's been running since 1996, and we have a lot of work that's happened specifically in the North Saskatchewan watershed region. And I'll show you in a few minutes here exactly how you can tap into that data and tap into some of those water quality reports so that we have informed stewards who are aware of um, the resources that are available to them. Lake Watch, like I mentioned, it's really a participatory program in the sense that our own staff are meeting with members of the public and working together to collect water quality data. So instead of us sending a kit out and training someone and equipping them to collect data, our staff meet with them, we hop on their boat, and we work together to collect data and samples and observations. Lake Watch is a really comprehensive program. It's based on the Provincial Monitoring Program and is supported largely by Alberta Environment and Protected Areas. I always have to remember the new acronyms. This is a really comprehensive program. It's collecting information on nutrients, um, general water chemistry, routine water chemistry, physical parameters like temperature, um, things like oxygen profiles, biological parameters like phytoplankton and zooplankton samples, chlorophyll A, measurements of fat, blue-green algae, or cyanobacteria in lakes, and also doing invasive species sampling for zebra mussels, phytomussels, mussels, spiny water flea, Eurasian water milfoil. This is a, a really comprehensive program, and we're lucky to have such strong support for it. You can see the growth of the program over the years. As the dots get bigger, it just indicates that we have visited those sites more frequently. Each year now, we're doing about 30 lakes. And if you are interested in having your lake monitored, we don't necessarily have a specific schedule. So we encourage you just to reach out and we respond largely by requests for monitoring. So this upcoming season, we generally have our lake sites selected. And a number of those sites are going to be in the North Saskatchewan watershed region, 
partly due to that support by Kelsey's Regional Lake Stewardship Project. One of the great things about this long-term program is that we're able to look at long-term trends in water quality. So in our organization, we're only running trend analysis on lakes with 10 or more years of data. And you can see here that environmental data is messy. There's a lot of variability, um, missing uh, like data gaps that can make running trend analysis really tricky. Um, so environmental data sets are inherently messy, but I think what's interesting, especially about this specific graph is the variability in water quality conditions that you can experience from year to year. And this is something that our partners on the ground also mentioned to us. One year they have a really good water quality year and the next year they have a really bad water quality year. And so a lot of the data we collect, I'm hoping, is going to help us really answer the question of what is driving water quality conditions each year in Alberta. We have some good research already that points really to spring conditions and snow melt conditions, things like that. But it is a, an interesting question, and I think one that needs more attention in Alberta. You can see in some cases trends in water quality, such as this total dissolved solids graph, they can be quite dramatic over time. And so looking at the multitude of factors that might influence this, such as lake levels, evaporation, or flooding conditions, trying to understand what's driving changes in water quality is a really interesting question. So if you're curious about your own lake, I will show you in a second here how to view all these results. When you look at one of our reports, we've really tried to add some value to the reports. Um, our program manager, Caleb, has done a good job of this. In terms of adding extra information, so you can see here, we're breaking out individual major ions and demonstrating their individual concentrations, as well as providing information on how does our um, complement of major ions compared to all the other lakes that were sampled that year. Are we on the high end? Are we in the low end? Do we have questions about the impacts of road salts, for example, on our lake water quality? So just trying to add value each year that we uh, work on these reports. So if you haven't seen a lake watch report in, in some time, I recommend going to our website and checking that out. We're also including local weather station data and lining that information up with the sampling dates just to try and better interpret maybe temperature or dissolved oxygen conditions within a specific lake. So understanding if it is a really windy period or a really warm period preceding a sampling event helps us to kind of interpret what we're seeing in the results. So I'm going to try and be fancy and <laughs> show you guys uh, some of the information that is available to you as stewards. So let me see if I can make this work here. The first link that I have here is to our own website. And maybe Kelsey or Kayla, can you confirm you're now seeing the website? Yep, yeah, you're good to go. Okay. Thanks. So on our website, it's just alms.save slash reports. You can find a section that just lists any of the lakes that we have run long-term trend analysis on. We also summarize all of the trend results, whether they're significant increasing or decreasing or no change. Uh, we summarize all those reports annually. So we'll have another one of those reports coming out shortly here. You can find those reports there. You can find as well all of the individual lake reports, and those have the watersheds uh, associated with them. So if you're looking for information on lakes within the North Saskatchewan watershed, you can find it in this table here. If we want, for example, we could look up something like Wabaman, the 2021 report. Um, it just opens as a PDF, and you can access all of that information. At the bottom of each of the reports is the trend analysis section. Just give it a second to load here. You can see long-term trends in total phosphorus, chlorophyll A, that measure of algae biomass, total dissolved solids, changes in ions, and changes in water clarity over time. So if you haven't checked these out, I encourage you to do so. And all of the 2022 reports will be out shortly here. 
as well, I've listed as a resource the Provincial Water Quality Data Portal. So I've got the link there for you. All of our Lake Watch data is actually stored in the Provincial Database. Once the data is in that database, you can actually distinguish it from data that we've collected versus data that, say, the province has collected. So if you want to find any raw data from Lake Watch, just head to this portal. I've added a layer, which is watersheds. It gives you these options to click on specific layers to visualize. I clicked on surface water, lakes, and then composite stations. And from there, I can click on any of these sites. So let's pick one in the North Saskatchewan watershed. Let's pick Spring Lake. And I could download easily all of the historical data available for Spring Lake that's in the provincial database. If you want to, you can also go to surface water quality data, data downloads, and select any location that's available to you and download that data. But that's essentially where the data comes from that's in all of our Lake Watch reports. Okay, I'll exit out of that one. And the one other um, website I wanted to show you uh, is Alberta Rivers. This has a lot of the water quantity data that exists on lakes, so water level data. And on the um, legend here, you can select environmental data. This brings up all of these great sites. From there, you can zoom in on a site. So let's take a look here at Wabaman, for example. And we can choose to download all of the historical water level data in a table or I could even see current water level data as a graph. So this is just recent water level data. So if you're looking for resources, this is where we actually download the information that goes into the water level graphs in our Lake Watch reports. And it's available to the public as well through rivers.alberta.ca. So just wanted to share some of those resources. Let me just make sure my computer's not gonna die. Okay, great. <laughs> so. Um, moving right along, um, in addition to our Lake Watch program, we have our Lake Keepers program. Lake Keepers is more of a traditional citizen science program where we're equipping and training people to collect water quality data. And because we are not required to be at the sampling events, we're able to have a much larger geographic reach with this program which has been great, especially for serving some of the northern Indigenous communities that we work with. So samples are collected three times throughout the summer season and then sent back to our office where we distribute those samples to specific labs and we process that data. Because of the method of this program, it is more ideal for a small circular lake, but reach out to us if you're interested in monitoring a lake uh, in your watershed and we can talk about what program might be best for that. But we definitely encourage everyone to get involved either through Lake, Lake Watch or Lake Keepers. Lake Keepers also runs in the winter time. You can see here Walt from the Myton Lake Management Association collecting samples from the Stony Plain region uh, last winter or two winters ago. This program collects information on nutrients, chemistry, physical parameters, biological parameters, environmental observations like snow thickness, ice thickness, um, the color of the ice, that's really important for light penetration in the wintertime. You can see here Sue and Neil from the Wabaman Watershed Management Council out collecting samples at Wabaman Lake two winters ago. This program has a huge uptake. Um, just this, so you can see in, it started in 2018 with only like less than 20 sampling events. We're now in 2021, 2022, we had just over 120. And then last season, like this past winter, I think we had 175. So that's just sampling events between December and March. So people are pretty excited about collecting winter data. I am too. It's a huge data gap, a huge gap in our understanding of how lakes function. Um, we know that in only five years, our program has collected as much winter data as has been collected in the past three decades in the province. So we're trying to fill this data gap and it's really cool being able to look at the interesting data that we're getting out of this program. For example, uh, temperature and oxygen profiles under the ice throughout the winter. It's really interesting to see how the conditions are changing 
especially for uh, or considering fish habitat. Um, in the wintertime, we all know that fish kills can occur in low oxygen conditions. So it's been interesting to track that on, at so many lakes throughout the wintertime. We also install a buoy into Pigeon Lake, and this buoy collects data about every 15 minutes on light, temperature, and oxygen at various steps throughout the winter season. This data is available in our winter water quality report, so I encourage you guys to check it out if you have not seen that data yet, but the winter season is just an exciting time for us to be out there. You might think that there's not a lot happening in the winter, but we work on a lake up north in the Beaver River watershed that has a persistent cyanobacteria bloom all winter long with toxins, uh, toxin concentrations that exceed health guidelines, January, February, March. Um, and in the springtime, I just wanted an excuse to show you guys these photos. This is Muriel Lake uh, in the Beaver River watershed last week. Sometimes we do get pretty significant cyanobacteria blooms in the fall or spring seasons. And this is a bloom of a specific bacteria called Planktothrix, a pink cyanobacteria that generally does carry a significant toxin risk to it. So the lovely volunteers at Muriel Lake, Richard, uh, sent us some samples and data on this bloom and, and we've sent that in for analysis this week. There is an active health um, advisory at this lake currently. Um, in terms of our lake keepers program, a lot of our volunteers have just run with it and made it their own. And so just a shout out to the folks who are working on the lakes of the Carville Pitted Delta project in the North Saskatchewan watershed, Stony Plain, um, Spruce Grove area. In 2021, I'll jump to this slide. 2021, this group of volunteers from the Myton Lake Management Association monitored 40 lakes in this small region of maybe, you know, like 100 lakes. And last summer, they monitored 50 lakes. And that's not even including all of the winter work that they've done. But it's allowed us to put together these really interesting water quality reports, which we're reporting on separately on our website. So if you're interested in this like unique geological region with these really valuable lake resources, I encourage you to check out the lakes of the Carville Pit Delta project that our stewards in the North Saskatchewan watershed have kind of turned the Lake Keepers program into their own project. And it's been really fun to support them on that work. So if you want to access any of the Lake Keepers data, I encourage you to check out our website, either the Summer Lake Keepers or the Winter Lake Keepers um, web pages. And I'll also mention that you can find all of that data on Data Stream. It looks like I don't have the website up uh, handy, but all of our Lake Keepers data is stored on Data Stream. So I encourage you to check that out. Go to the Winnipeg um, data stream portal, and you can see all of the data, including the winter data that we've collected through our Lake Keepers program. There's also a nice feature that allows you to compare your lake to another lake on that website. So definitely give that a, a look. We've done some interesting work in the North Saskatchewan region on visualizing lakes using satellite imagery. And this is a cool project in partnership with the U of A and the ABMI to really help us understand the extent of blue-green algae and cyanobacteria blooms, the severity of those blooms or the intensity of those blooms. And if you combine the intensity and the extent of a bloom, you get this index, which is like a severity index. And this is something that traditional monitoring approaches can't really do. But when we combine our monitoring at the same time that a satellite passes overhead and we kind of teach that satellite imagery what the values in the water mean, we can create these really interesting visuals of cyanobacteria blooms at lakes in Alberta over time. So here's a snapshot of a couple images from Pigeon Lake. You can see a bloom on the southwestern shore there. You can see an intense bloom on the northwestern shore on this specific day. And then on this day, you can actually see the blooms swirling throughout the lake as the wind pushes them along. So 
This project is continuing next year. We'll be running this project at Pigeon Lake, Wapaman Lake, Nackaman Lake, Bethel Lake, Maclebish, Two Basins, and Sylvan Lake. So we're hoping to develop this kind of tool that stewards could use to better understand their lakes uh, over the next couple of years. And big thanks to the folks who've helped us collect these samples over the past couple of years at Wabaman, Pigeon, Lesser Slave, and Lacklebish. Um, I'm happy to report no invasive species found last year, but folks have been looking um, each year for zebra and quagga mussels and for invasive Eurasian water milfoil. Um, big thanks to the NSWA staff for supporting our search for invasive water milfoil species. Um, we send about 50 samples a year to a genetics lab that does some DNA work on these species and tries to help us figure out is it invasive or is it native. If you see what you think is Northern or Eurasian milfoil, I encourage you to give us a shout, take a picture, collect a sample, put it in a Ziploc bag with some water, and we can help you figure out if it's the native or invasive variety. I'll also mention too, if you want to get involved with our Lake Stewardship Community or Practice Project, we have created this forum, this online forum, where we allow Lake Stewards to connect with each other, to share with each other, to learn from each other. So check out our website, and then also you can send me a note if you want to be added to that mailing list, and we'll make sure you get involved um, with that project. We're hoping to do four more meetings in 2023-2024. You can also find us on Facebook at Alberta Lake Stewardship. Kelsey has helped set this page up. I don't think we have much on there right now, but we're hoping to use it as new opportunities arise. So if Facebook is your social media of choice, definitely give us a follow there. Just a shout out to some of the folks who supported the work that you've seen in today's presentation. I've missed a ton of people here. Uh, Maya to Lake Management Association, the ABMI, the University of Alberta, um, Stony Plain Fish and Game Association. Uh, so many people come together to make our our various projects possible. So I'll end it there. Uh, I'll leave maybe my contact info up for a second. That phone number is definitely wrong. It's just 780-702-2567. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there's any questions or if we have time for questions, Kelsey. I don't see anything coming in just yet, but I did put in that uh, Alberta Lake Stewardship Facebook page. Uh, like how you mentioned, yeah, we haven't generated too much yet, but uh, I think that kind of will come over time. And yeah, I look forward to that. But thank you so much, Brad. I appreciate that. And it's fascinating to see the pink algae bloom. I don't think I can say that I've ever seen that before. <laughs> yeah, it, it's happened at lakes closer by to Edmonton before too, like Devil's Lake. Um, mm -hmm. One fall, it bloomed really intensely at Fork Lake. It bloomed under the ice and the ice was pink. Um, at, actually at Devil's Lake, there was a large pink bloom in the ice as well. So it can definitely happen and it is a health concern, but it's also just super interesting when it happens. It's so rare to see like this color out in the water. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And I got a question here. How do you teach a satellite <laughs> to interpret that data to create those lake watch and space maps? <laughs> yeah, good question, Carrie. So we are working with the ABMI geospatial scientists who are basically um, taking the imagery from the satellite. This is the Sentinel-2 satellite. So it's a tricky project because what we have to do is time our sampling on a cloud-free, smoke-free day that the satellite is passing overhead so that the samples we're collecting match the imagery that the satellite is collecting. And we'll sample 20 to 30 sites across a lake. And then we basically download that imagery and we tell that imagery what concentrations of chlorophyll are at the pixels where we've collected our samples. And if we do that in low chlorophyll concentrations and high chlorophyll concentrations, 
you can actually apply that algorithm to future images to convert the imagery into chlorophyll A concentrations and to visualize it in that really interesting way. So it's been an interesting project to coordinate. Big shout out to our program manager who's really led that over the past couple of years. But yeah, it's, it's I think, going to be a valuable tool, especially for some of these large lakes where you can get really nice satellite images from. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> no, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's definitely out of my realm of knowledge, but <laughs> glad someone's <laughs> approaching it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see anything else too much popping up. But yeah, if okay. um, you have any questions for any of us, uh, feel free to throw them in the chat. Or honestly, you can unmute yourself and feel free to ask. But I see people slowly starting to trickle out here. But and I did, Kelsey, add a couple of other resources into yeah. the chat as well with a couple different links related to uh, native plants. Yeah, and I should have 